I'm Nick. Uh, I live in the Bates Hendricks neighborhood, and uh, we have a marketing committee that we uh, work with to try to do marketing efforts, and I'm here to talk a little bit about those here today. Uh, my name and email are down here. If you have questions afterwards, think of something later, just send me an email, and uh, it will also be on the last slide. Okay, so the first thing you want to do uh, is form a team. You need to know the people that you're working with uh, to accomplish your goals, and, and ideally you pull together people with you know, backgrounds in, in these categories, graphic arts, marketing, sales, web design, writing. Those are all great things, great uh, professions that uh, have good experience in doing these type of things. In reality, you may get one or two of those, you may have none of those, but that doesn't mean that everyone can't still contribute and come up with good ideas. Um, in our neighborhood, for instance, we've got uh, an engineer, an architect, um, a grant writer, and then several unrelated professions, but we're all still able to come together and uh, work with ideas, and other people will, will pitch ideas, and we uh, do our best to make it work. Uh, if you don't have any design talent in your neighborhood, uh, there are usually nonprofits like Big Car that you can partner with that maybe will help you design a logo, uh, do things like that. Uh, after you form your team, you need to figure out what your team is actually going to be doing. Like, uh, who do you want to market to? Do you want to market to people uh, both inside and outside the neighborhood? Or do your residents already pretty much know about the neighborhood and you just want to market to people outside the neighborhood? Or vice versa, maybe uh, the neighborhood's pretty well known, but you want to market to people in the neighborhood to engage them. So you really just need to come up with what your goals want to be so that everything that you do, you can look back and kind of check it against those goals and say, hey, are, are we on the right track here? It just gives you a framework for everything that you do. <clears throat> Excuse me, for everything that you do. Uh, and I'll just read you ours here, uh, our example. Uh, the Bates Hendricks Marketing Committee aims to promote the neighborhood to those both inside and outside the neighborhood and to engage residents with each other. We want this marketing to bring in new homeowners and investors that care about the neighborhood and want to make a positive impact in the neighbor in the area. We came up with a list of ideas that classified those ideas into short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals to act upon, and then we set target dates for each of those. The long-term goals don't have target dates, but for the other ones, we try to set a, a month or a year to, to, as a time frame to accomplish those goals. <coughs> and that just kind of keeps everything on track. So one of the first things you want to do after you've got your team is come up with a logo for your neighborhood. Or in the case of our neighborhood, we already had a logo, and we wanted to refresh it, give it a, a new look, uh, which we have done for, um, for neighborhood banners, street banners, which I don't have any pictures of that, but that's kind of where that started. And our logo was designed by uh, a board member. Um, he's a landscape architect. We had an iris as our logo before, and he uh, freshened up, made it look punchier, and. Uh, just a little cooler, I think, than uh, our previous logo. So um, because the logo will be at the heart of everything you do, you want to make sure that you like it and uh, that it's, it speaks to something about your neighborhood. So for instance, the iris, I believe, was chosen because it's a hardy flower, uh, it's berry, and uh, it also works towards our goal of uh, promoting our neighborhood as a garden district. There's lots of gardens and parks that we're trying to build up in the neighborhood. Um, so a nice punchy you know, symbol or logo, you know, using your logo, a distinctive font is always helpful as well. Um, we tr uh, trademarked ours, our logo, on the uh, Secretary of State website. It's only $10. Uh, I, it was another board member that, that did that. Uh, so I can't tell you the exact process, but you go to their website, you should be able to follow along on there. And if you want more info about that, I can put you in touch with uh, her or find out the process uh, if you email me uh, later. So as you're coming up with your logo, you want to keep in mind uh, ways to make it scalable. So maybe it's on a t-shirt or maybe it's on a banner. You want to make sure that it is uh, going to be scaled up and down without losing quality. And to do that, you'll use a vector graphic, uh, which you know most people are familiar with, like a JPEG, which is a raster graphic. It's a fixed image. You blow it up, 
it's going to lose quality. A vector graphic is basically redrawn every time that file is open. And uh, typical files are uh, EPS, that's probably the most common vector based uh, file. You use like a, a program like Adobe Illustrator for that. Uh, I used AutoCAD because that's what I'm familiar with. So by, by doing the vector graphic, then you can take your, your artwork to any design that you end up doing uh, and it'll keep that quality the same. Um, then um, you can use different, a range of different colors, the palette, and you can control that with different layers in your logo or you can have separate logos just depending on who's making it and what they feel comfortable doing. But for ours, um, you see on the previous page, there's extra shading there in the, the leaves of the plant and in the flower there. And then we have a two color version there, which is on the polo shirts here as well. Um, and the reason you want to scale these down is if you're trying to save money uh, on doing printing things, this was a lot cheaper to do uh, to pick these colors than our full set of palettes to do all the stitching. So if you can scale it down color wise too, even a uh, two color version, that also helps. So keep that in mind as you're coming up with it to, to make sure that it can uh, be adjustable to suit the needs of whatever you're, you're printing it on. Uh, here are a couple other logos I like from our uh, nearby neighborhoods, Garfield Parks to the south, Fountain Squares to the east of our neighborhood. Um, and I think they both do a great job of using you know, punchy graphics, good distinct fonts, and they say a little bit about the neighborhood. Like Fountain Square, you see Virginia Avenue and Shelby, the, the angle, and it's got uh, a lot of artistic motif going on to promote the uh, arts district that it is. And Garfield Park, of course, has the, the trees uh, of the park and its uh, defining pagoda there. Um, another uh, handy thing to have, and you'll use this for everything that you do, uh, is just a uh, media package. And it doesn't have to be anything special, just in a folder or, you know, have someone keep track of, you know, official photos that you want to use. Uh, for your neighborhood, It'll, you know, you'll have your logo. You might want to have it in a few different formats. You know, a JPEG, like which I said earlier, it's, it's a common format, but it's not scalable. So maybe you include an EPS file as well, or a PNG, which um, is also raster based, but it, it tends to scale better. Um, so those are just some some options for that. Your high res photos that you want to include doesn't necessarily mean a lot of megapixels. That, that always helps, but you want to also make sure that you have a good camera lens when you're taking these shots, and maybe not a cell phone camera, although they're getting better. Um, and uh, good lighting. Always be mindful of lighting when, when you're taking these photos. Um, you know, gauge the, the, the sun throughout the day to make sure you get an optimal lighting on uh, what you want to photograph. And then uh, artistic angles. You know, if, if you can, if there's Kind of look around, cite it different, a few different ways, take a few different photos of, of whatever you're wanting to photograph, and that'll give you, uh, you know, something that looks a little more dynamic instead of, you know, a, maybe a straight-on photo that would otherwise look boring. So uh, these things are just um, photos of maybe your neighborhood has something special or unique, amenities. Maybe it's just houses in your neighborhood. It can be anything really that speaks to your neighborhood. That, that you'll distribute these. You'll post them on social networking sites. If there's press releases that go out, you know you might include these or your logo or both with them. Uh, so just up front, it's good to have a, a good collection of photos and your logo to, uh, to use as you uh, do all your other marketing efforts. Uh, another great thing that we did pretty early on uh, was a website. And it basically just gives your neighborhood an official face for people to come to and find out official information. Um, so uh, ours is BatesHendricks.org, and I won't go through the entire site, um, but on the home page we have a, a running slideshow that just has, that's a Bates Hendricks house, that's our distinctive fe uh, feature that the, the neighborhood was named after. And uh, then we have several slides that scroll through uh, of just you know, projects and things that we've done in the neighborhood. And it just shows people that you know, you're active and doing things, and 
hopefully wants to encourage them to get involved. And then we have uh, our sponsors on the homepage too, uh, neighborhoods that uh, help sponsor us, and uh, they're small donations, but it, it all helps. And um, then we have uh, a news page that has links to our Facebook page, and uh, archived newsletters that we, that we put out are on there. There's an about page that has just a little bit of information about the neighborhood and its history. Uh, we have a map, which is good for letting people know where you actually are. Uh, you know, we are still trying to define ourselves as distinct from Fountain Square, because to a lot of people, Fountain Square is a huge, it's you know, all of the southeast area around Fountain Square, and you know, we want to be distinct from that. We appreciate Fountain Square, we love Fountain Square, but we are our own neighborhood and we want people to know that. Uh, we have contact information for all of our board members on there. We have an involvement page that has contact information for how to get involved or know who your block club captains are. We also have um, um, task forces to, to do special project related things. So all that information is on there so you have a way to get people in touch with them. And then we have a resources page that has info like our um, uh, information about the Mayor's Action Center, and our neighborhood liaison, um, our local uh, community development corporation, SEND, which is a Southeast Neighborhood uh, Development. Uh, they so there's links to that there's links to our quality of life plan for the, the southeast uh, all on the resources page and, and other other tools so it's a very useful tool to have uh, both for residents and people outside the resident uh, outside the neighborhood uh, we've had several new homeowners that that is their first engagement with the neighborhood as a website oh I discovered you through the website um, and that's that's great to hear uh, another thing that I recommend doing early on is to get on the web and establish a marketing uh, presence through Facebook, Twitter, and Nextdoor. Uh, Facebook is, uh, of course, probably, I think most people are probably on there, I would imagine. Uh, and it's a good way, we have uh, regular people, uh, there's a group of us that have access to, to posts, so not just one person is managing everything, which is helpful. Um, and we post uh, upcoming events, photos from previous events, so people can see what you, you're doing. We have news stories that are in or around the neighborhood that people would find interesting. And then we have inspirational stories. So if we see something cool that something else, someone else is doing, we'll post that up there as well. And the, um, the posts, you want to, of course, especially with many people doing them, you might want to meet beforehand to, to discuss about you know, rules so people aren't posting inflammatory posts and making sure people are responding to other comments uh, well. Because if you have all these posts and people are posting comments and they're not getting official responses back from the neighborhood, then it's not really a, a two-way communication that it should be. And uh, it's, people aren't getting that interactive experience that really helps build, build your reputation. Um, so, and then finally, Nextdoor is a um, relatively new site. Is everyone familiar with Nextdoor? Has everyone heard of that? Um, for those that haven't, it's, it's basically a social networking site like Facebook, only it's tied into your, where you live, and you have to uh, sign up with your address, and then it allows neighbors to engage with other neighbors. And uh, that's also a great resource to uh, disseminate information. Okay, and another thing that we did are these brochures. They're trifold brochures. You can see them up there on the screen as well. Um, we put um, a lot of the stuff that was on the website, basically. It's just a, a trimmed down version uh, to pass out to people and, you know, let them know about your neighborhood. And so there's just a general information about the neighborhood. Again, we got the map, so people know where you are. Uh, nearby amenities, so we got a lot of stuff about Fountain Square in there because Fountain Square is great. It's a great amenity. Uh, we're near downtown as well, so that's another great amenity to have that aren't necessarily in the neighborhood, but it's good to promote as being close to the neighborhood. Uh, and then, of course, we have links to our social media. And um, you'll probably want to print a bunch of these up at a time to save money. And doing so means that you'll want it to last a while. Because if these are going to be around for a couple of years, you want that information to still be current in a couple of years. So 
put as much in there as you can to describe your neighborhood, but also keep it as generic as possible. Um, so, you know, dates and times are maybe left out, so it still makes sense in two years. Um, if you're using photos, uh, all of our, almost all of our photos were, were taken by uh, neighbors. So there weren't any licensing issues. There was one that we licensed from uh, a neighbor in Fountain Square. And um, it's, it's a good idea if you're using someone else's photos before you print up a bunch of these, just to get the rights to it from whoever took it. Or a lot of times, you know, people will just give you a photo. Uh, but you just want to make sure that you have that uh, before printing up a bunch of them. Uh, and then definitely proofread it. And then proofread it again. <laughs> because like I said, you're going to print out uh, maybe a thousand of these or more, and you don't want to be seeing that same mistake for several years. Then comes time to print them after you've designed them. And um, there's kind of two, two places you can go to. You've got local printers and you've got online printers. And uh, we started out working with local printers, and it's a great resource. Uh, first of all, it's, it's great for the city to support local business, and it's um, helpful for you because they can give you input. Like uh, we did a full bleed, uh, you know, like on the cover here. So you want to make sure your margins come out right so that, that so you don't have a white space around it. And to make sure that you're, uh, when you fold it, these colors all line up with the edge. They'll, they'll work with you to make sure that, that all that works out with their equipment. Whereas if you do it online, you submit it and you get what you get. It comes in the mail. You can order proofs from some of those places. You still have to pay for the proof to come and, and there's a waiting period. So there's a couple alternatives. It's good to get prices from both local and online. Uh, I would get quotes from at least two online and two local um, different places and just see because that those prices are always fluctuating. Uh, so, you know, different promotions, uh, just different times of the year. And then before you do your final proof, because you'll want to get a uh, if you do it locally especially, print up one that people can look over and test out. Again, <laughs> I can't stress that enough. Hi, Nick. Yes? Could you share with us like, what was your process of decision making, like which logo to go, what content to write there, like is there any like committee to decide or like how did you know like residents there or agree to have? Well, we started with uh, our, when we formed our marketing committee team. So anyone that was interested in, you know, the marketing efforts, they came uh, to be part of the marketing committee. And for, for big things, the mold will run, like when we did street banners, we took those back to the full neighborhood association meetings and had them, um, you know, review them first before going out. And I can't remember if we did that with the brochures or not. Uh, we may have shown them beforehand, but I, I can't recall. All right, you're welcome. Uh, so then, you've got your brochures printed, and you want to get them out to people. Uh, we have them on hand at our neighborhood meetings, uh, so especially new people coming in, you can give them to them to find out about your neighborhood. Um, you've probably got people in your neighborhood, it's maybe you, because you're here today, that are very proactive in the neighborhood, very engaged, always talking to people. Give them a bunch of, give them a stack full of, of uh, brochures to hand out to people. They see someone new moving on the block, they'll come and give it to them. They meet some new acquaintance through the neighborhood or they can help the neighborhood, give them a brochure. Uh, another fun thing that I love doing, and it works out really well for everyone, is if you see a realtor sign, call the number on there, talk to the realtor, and ask them if you can put some brochures in the house that they're trying to sell. The realtors love it because it makes the house more marketable because the homeowners get an idea of what's going on in the neighborhood. At the same time, the, the potential homeowners find out and realize, hey, there's a good association here. They're doing good things in the neighborhood. Uh, I want to be a part of that. And you get good neighbors in. So the neighborhood wins, realtors win, the potential home buyers win. So it's, it's a really great thing that you can do. And then the realtors uh, know about your neighborhood and that helps them sell other properties in the neighborhood. Uh, and then if you have like a library or a community center or any other you know, public building in the neighborhood, ask if you can just put a, a little stand or stack of brochures there that people in passing might uh, see. Um, something else that we do is a monthly neighborhood newsletter. Uh, monthly and quarterly are pretty common times. 
uh, for to distribute them. We just have general information. Uh, you know, things. The first page is usually uh, stuff that upcoming meetings that we'll have or uh, important news. And then the second page we have uh, sponsors again that help us uh, print up the newsletter, and um, we'll have a letter from the, the president. Our neighborhood president has an editorial letter each month. And, um, and then the, the back of the page, we have just a generic uh, information about the neighborhood that gets repeated in every newsletter. It has um, just a brief summary of what the neighborhood association is and does, and where we meet, the meeting time, and uh, then our Facebook page link, and then there's a calendar on the back. Uh, you can do it you know, a variety of different ways. Ours is just an 11 by 17 that gets printed and folded. Um, you could do a you know two-sided eight and a half by eleven newsletter. It's it's really whatever whatever whoever is running that chooses to, to do and, and can manage to do. And it is a lot to manage doing a newsletter. It helps to have several different people uh, feeding in articles uh, that will, will write the articles and send them in, and then one person edits it and puts it out and creates a document that can be printed. And we also email ours out. Our neighborhood president has a blast list that uh, that, the, that he sends those out through. Um, so I think that covers that. Once you have a, a neighborhood newsletter, then you got to get it out to to residents. Same kind of deal as the brochures. Um, you, I already talked about monthly or quarterly. Uh, we do the digital delivery and then uh, we also do paper delivery. So we'll have one person that prints up the newsletters and distributes them to a few houses around the neighborhood. And those are usually done by street or section of the street. We don't have the entire neighborhood covered. It's a volunteer basis. So as people are volunteering to deliver on a street, then that's, um, that's who gets it. Uh, ideally, we have the whole neighborhood, but you, you have to work with what you got. So um, they're printed, distributed to volunteers on the street, and then those volunteers put them on each uh, house's uh, doorstep that is subscribed to it. And basically, all we do for people that subscribe to it is express an interest at the neighborhood meeting. And then oftentimes, we'll still leave them at other houses. If we see someone new move in, we'll, we'll put them there as well. It's really up to the discretion of the person delivering them. They'll get a set number that they can choose to distribute however they need to. Um, one thing I will note, USPS does not allow you to put newsletters in mailboxes. So uh, we usually just roll them up and stick them in, uh, in the doorknob, or if there's a screen door that you can open, put it between a screen door and the, the main door. Um, and then, if, again, if there's houses for sale and you're distributing brochures, leave a newsletter in there and let potential home buyers know what's going on in your neighborhood. Uh, we have a lot of fun making t-shirts. and. Um, this is a pretty simple design. We went with two color. Uh, it's actually one color is what the, the printing company would call it. But you have your base color for your shirt, and then it's one color of ink and, uh, that goes on there. Um, so first we did the uh, navy slash purple, whatever you want to call it, um, shirts uh, as our first run. And then later on, we did these gray ones. Um, the inverse because working outside in the summer gets pretty hot and it's nice to have a lighter colored shirt uh, to work to wear while you're doing neighborhood projects. Um, these that we did cost about five dollars a shirt and then there's a few different options for, for distributing these. Uh, one you can if you have the money up front to, to do that you can order them buy them and distribute them to anyone that wants them in the neighborhood. That gets them out quickly. Your name is, is getting seen and out there a, a lot faster. You can sell them for $10 and make a profit and use that money to put back in towards other marketing efforts that you might want to do. And uh, finally, which is what we do, uh, we sell them pretty much at cost. Uh, so we recoup the, the initial investment money that we can put back into ordering other t-shirts while still keeping the price low and accessible for most residents um, that want one. Uh, so for your initial order, you'll kind of have to guess on how many of each t-shirt size that you want. And it is a bit of guesswork. The uh, printer that you go with will probably be able to help you, uh, you know, come up with common sizes that you want to use. 
Uh, and then you might think about the type of people that are coming to your neighborhood association meeting. Uh, we have sizes all the way from small to triple XL. And we'll you know, gauge those sizes and, and then our, our first run, you know, some were selling well and some weren't. So for our second run that we, we did, then we ordered less of the ones that we already had a bunch of. And, and you can kind of balance that way over, over multiple orders. But at first it is a lot of guesswork. But uh, once you do sell them, keep track of, of what you're selling. Then you'll know what to reorder. Uh, some other things that you can do are uh, branding items. We have uh, thank you cards or greeting cards. So if you've got sponsor, uh, neighborhood sponsor, you want to thank them, or a new resident moves in, you want to welcome them, or maybe someone in your neighborhood that's done uh, a lot of special work or efforts, you want to thank them. Uh, those are nice for doing that. We also turned up these uh, fun little buttons. And uh, they're a good way to get visibility out for, for your neighborhood. Uh, we haven't done stickers or decals yet. Uh, that's on our to-do list. They're coming out pricey so far, uh, so hopefully we can find a better deal. I think the last we looked, it was maybe three or four dollars a sticker, which we thought was too much. No one was going to want to pay that. Um, another thing that we've done is uh, we've left door hangers on people's doors. And what we've tried to do every few years is give everyone in the neighborhood, we have 1,500 houses in the neighborhood, uh, give everyone in the neighborhood a newsletter, at least, you know, uh, for whatever that whatever month it falls on. It's, it's not special, but just to let them know that there is a neighborhood association, there are things going on in the neighborhood, um, and it, there's contact information in there for people that want to get involved. Well, for this, we did something a little extra special, um, and we did had door hangers printed up, and you, we made them kind of, our theme was save the date, and tried to hopefully get more notice than a regular door hanger, and um, hopefully not just thrown out right away. Uh, we don't know, we have no metric for measuring that, but um, we did have our, our contact info on there, just a little about the neighborhood, and then uh, on this one here, we just listed you know, uh, some recent projects that we'd done positive things that, that the association was doing in the neighborhood. Um, this is another thing that we have not yet done. It is on our to-do list. Uh, we obviously have the design <coughs> work already done. Uh, just waiting on more funds for printing costs uh, to do signs. Uh, but our idea behind it is we want to give these to a few people uh, to you know, scatter throughout the neighborhood. Uh, to stick on the ground a few days before each neighborhood association meeting. So we have just generic info on there. Um, our meeting time doesn't change, our meeting location doesn't change, and then it just says neighborhood meeting. And we have those monthly, so those can be stuck on the ground you know, a few days before each neighborhood meeting and uh, let people know. And uh, it's always on a Monday, so maybe you, you put it on the ground on a Friday evening or Saturday something like that. Uh, again, we went with a two-color scheme here for printing costs. It saves money. Um, something that is a lot of fun to do and really get your name out there is to be active beyond your own neighborhood. So it's, it's great to do things in the neighborhood, but you're not meeting new potential homeowners that want to be engaged with your neighborhood until you get out beyond your neighborhood, usually. Um, so, uh, whatever you do, make sure people are wearing your, your branded t-shirts and you'll see a big group of people doing something and say, hey, that's a, that's a group that's really involved, I gotta look them up. Um, so something we did this year, we got on board with the uh, Indy City Football League, which is uh, a soccer team, it's a soccer league, uh, plays downtown, it's the season's over now. Uh, it's mostly downtown Indianapolis neighborhoods. There's a few other outliers as well. And um, it's just a, a fun way to get neighbors engaged and hanging out and get your, your name out there. Uh, down there on the bottom left is our chili cook-off from February. We have a fundraiser chili cook-off uh, every winter um, and try to raise as, as much as we can. And that money goes back into the neighborhood association uh, so we can do, you know, projects in the neighborhood and also help support our marketing efforts. 
the top middle photo there is uh, an outing that we did this summer. We went to an Indians, Indianapolis Indians baseball game, and I think a few of us actually watched the game. I didn't, <laughs> but we had fun, we talked and, and hung out, it was great. And then um, the last two photos there are from uh, different parades that we participated in. So being in a parade really gets your name out there. It's announced as you're, as you're come, coming along through the parade route, and uh, you know, people, it gives you name recognition. And then sometimes, no matter what you do, uh, there are some things you, you can't control whatsoever, and they'll do more than all of your marketing efforts combined. So sometimes it's, it's good just to have a little bit of luck. Um, obviously, everyone is now familiar. I actually had this in my presentation uh, long before I knew our keynote speaker was. But um, their pilot episode was in our neighborhood in Bates Hendricks, and that was mentioned several times on the show. And uh, at different parade booths that we've had set up, uh, we've had people come to us and say, Oh, Bates Hendricks, that's where Two Chicks and a Hammer is doing their, their show, right? Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. And, uh, you know, we didn't plan that. It didn't happen uh, because of uh, anything that we have collaborated with them. It may have happened because of our marketing efforts, but we can't prove that either. Um, so sometimes it, it's nice to have a little luck. Um, so now I'm sure this has been in the back of your mind all along. How do you fund all of this stuff? because there is a lot of money involved uh, for, for a lot of these things. Um, you can have association dues. Now, we try to keep our association dues pretty low. Um, it's, uh, a lot of the neighborhood is very low income. So we have $3 annual dues for uh, individuals and $5 for household. And then uh, for businesses, it's $25 just to be a member. And then we have additional uh, sponsorship beyond that level with businesses to if they want to go beyond just being a member and help be a sponsor for our newsletter and on the website. Uh, you can have other events, but like I mentioned before, we have a chili cook-off that, that raises a uh, decent amount of money and has great food if you love chili. And uh, there are crowdfunding sites which work well if you have uh, certain projects that you want to do in the neighborhood but don't have funding for. Um, so GoFundMe, I don't know if everyone's heard of that, it's like Kickstarter anyone has heard of Kickstarter. But it's basically a way for a website, you can put up a page, uh, be descriptive, uh, it helps to have photos and graphics of a project that you would like to accomplish in the neighborhood, and then it lets people that, that come to that page to be able to donate uh, any amount of money that they want to it and to help you achieve your goal. Um, then if you have any businesses in your neighborhood, definitely get in touch with them to see what they can do to help because they want their business to grow and be successful. And having people in the neighborhood come to that business or use that business is helpful for them. So that's a win-win. Um, if there are grants uh, for certain projects or different neighborhood stuff, and I don't know a lot about that, but if you have someone in your neighborhood that, that is aware or knows grants coming through the pipeline to apply for, those are always great. Um, if you have a local CDC, uh, like ours is SEND, Southeast Neighborhood Development, um, you know, sometimes you can collaborate with them on, on projects, or they'll be doing projects in your neighborhood and see what you can do to work with them. If you uh, run your expenses through a nonprofit, such as your CDC, then you don't pay taxes on the items that you print up. Um, if your neighborhood is a nonprofit, then you would also not pay taxes, but uh, ours does not have that tax designation. Uh, and then finally, there's just um, these are some of the vendors that we've used in the past. You don't have to write all that down. But I'll have a link on the next slide if you want to download the presentation. Um, and I believe uh, INRC is going to be putting these up on the website as well, is what I heard. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we, we ran our first run of brochures um, through uh, Minuteman Press. We did parade banners through them and signs. Uh, we did our t-shirts. All of our t-shirts have gone through fine promotions there on Zionsville Road. Uh, PS Print is an online printer. We've done our secondary runs of rubber shirts there.
and this is what we want. We want to do something for our neighborhood. This is and all right. Now what? And coming up with uh, some ideas about what to do. Um, so it's really going to be dictated by money. So many things are. Um, if you have a lot of money or not a lot, but it's probably, it's probably ten.